session today and of the symposium. Now, uh, the first of the speakers, better to say, a speaker. Uh, they both came from Faculty of Humanities and Social, Social Studies, Department of Art History, is uh, Nikolina Maratovic. Uh, and the title of their paper is The Relevance of Yugo Karaman's Paradigm in Contemporary Research of the Late Antic and Early Medieval Heritage in Creation. So, you have time. Uh, thank you. I want to thank the uh, organizing committee for acceptance of our uh, proposal, uh, in which uh, we will try to discuss um, the relevance, actually, the, the applicability, better to say, of Yuval Karaman's paradigm in contemporary research of late antique and early medieval heritage in Croatia. In his Problems of Peripheral Art, published in 1963, Lubo Kahneman sought to establish an effective system for interpretation and evaluation of creation of this heritage, Eastern and Dalmatian in particular. His paradigm relied on four categories representative of different cultural surroundings, as you all know, provincial, peripheral, and borderline, each in a specific relation to the art and architecture of the century. He endeavored to explain and demonstrate his paradigm on various works of art and architecture, also some late antique and early medieval examples, including them in the category of borderline, because of their specific geographical position between major centers of artistic activity, Eastern and Western, Eastern and Western cultural spheres. Karaman's paradigm actually relies on the core axiom for perceiving and understanding Western European cultural history. If we try to explain it according to an appropriate mathematical model, and this was our uh, attempt to do so, uh, we will realize that Western European historical studies, and especially Western art history, perceive this process in terms of linear systems uh, with a superposition principle. I will explain that a bit later. The same model has been uh, well attested in history and history of art from the 19th century on as a convenient and probably most easily comprehensible tool for interpretation and valorization of artistic production. The scholars from which Karaman tried to distance himself, for example, von Heikelberger, Bevila, Sturzigowski, Freeman, Jackson, Rachki, etc., actually reached for the same model, although they instrumented it for their own purposes or certain political and ideological interests. Although Karaman succeeded, well succeeded, in distancing himself from the mentioned researchers, he actually followed the same logic and the same basic principle for understanding and explaining art and qualitative proliferation of its particular properties according to the principle of superposition of the center to the periphery and borderline regions. That same perception of linear development of history and culture is probably best summarized in Jacques Le Goff, short explanation of Translatio Imperi and Translatio Studi, a formula, uh, as a formula according to which the Western culture actually evolved. The idea of Translatio Imperi, with its chronological leaps, uh, perfectly illustrates the way in which linear system function, whose two main principles are additivity, additivity and homogeneity. Uh, and to explain that, during the course of the centuries, from the times of the Roman Empire to the modern age, there have been many fully successful, less successful or failed attempts of cultural translation, through successive establishments of Mei Romai, New Romans, may it be Ravenna, Aachen, some other town, or Rome again. Western thinkers, writers, scholars, popes, kings, strive throughout late antiquity and the early Middle Ages to impose themselves and claim their legitimacy for transference of the Imperium upon themselves and their close cultural circle. In terms of linear system theory, to their center, a measure for everything else outside of the center. 
they are sending. As to the properties, every such translatio strives to maintain homogeneity of the inheriting properties, but added, and this is the principle of additivity, some of its own interpretation, interpretations of the inherited. By these two stimuli or inputs, an idea of linear continuity was maintained. In general terms, such a process can by default tolerate just one claimant of legitimacy at a time, and that is why medieval history witnessed continual struggle between secular and ecclesiastical authorities from the Pope of Stephen II, and here we alluded, of course, to the forged donation of Constantine, according to which the Western Empire was left for the Protestants. Uh, just a, a, a short illustration of that linear tra translatio of that Romanicus uh, we are talking about from the Trojan myth, from Aeneas, from uh, Romulus and Remus, from the founding of the city of Rome, uh, through imperial, imperial pagan Rome, which established this kind, found this kind of uh, classical Romanicus, through Christian Rome, and here we refer primarily to. 5th century Rome with uh, Pope Sixtus III and his great endeavors, as Romanitas revisited because he really uh, attempted to revisit all that classical antiquity in a new way. And then we split it uh, in two directions. One is the one to the north, uh, then translates of to new regal or imperial centers, and the other one is. Uh, the Pope, this slide of the Pope's uh, stay uh, in the city of Rome. We refer to Ravenna, which uh, uh, actually uh, became the uh, Western, uh, the center of Western uh, Empire uh, at the beginning of the 5th century, although we call it here, here uh, illegal, not Imperial Ravenna, uh, because uh, the main point here was not so much Imperial Ravenna, but the regal Ravenna of the uh, King Theodoric, the Ostrogoth. Then, of course, Frankish, Frankish translatio, uh, based on uh, uh, some of that and adding something more, and of course, the, late, uh, the, the last one here that we are talking about is the Holy Roman Empire. And probably the, um, the, the greatest illustration for everyone of that uh, symbolic translatio was uh, Otto III coming into the tomb of, uh, of uh, Charlemagne and taking his imperial uh, insignia. Uh, the other line is the one, the one that follows what happened in Rome. We just uh, here uh, tried to um, emphasize three main points. Uh, Pope Gregory the Great, uh, as the founder of new medi medieval papal Romanicus, then Adrian I and Leo III, who were the contemporaries of Charlemagne and uh, who really Fully fledged that kind of Romanicus, uh, Leo III, as you all know, crowned uh, Charlemagne the Emperor. And finally, the 11th century Rome with the popes, with the investiture controversy and so on, uh, is the last point to which we will uh, refer to. Uh, here is that mathematical physical model. Uh, uh, to reach for a visual metaphor, we, uh, we reach for this kind of model. Linear system function as a wave. So the peaks of the wave would represent successful translaciones by which the centers are established. Further on, based on the same principle, they transmit the signals as far as possible, again, in the form of the wave. This particular logic is what Kahneman had in common with the other scholars, although their conclusions differed. However, the same logic fades when dealing with Byzantine or Eastern culture. <coughs> Kahneman himself was an opponent of those who emphasized Byzantine components in the cultural heritage of the Adriatic coast of the Eastern Adriatic and insisted on indigenous tendencies and inputs from the West. His standing can be explained in two ways. First, of course, Kahneman tried to distance himself from his predecessors and contemporaries. But the second reason is really that Byzantine heritage cannot and could not be comprehended from the perspective of linear systems. Today we are becoming aware that social, economic, religious, etc. fabric of uh, the Eastern Empire was by far more complex than researchers could fathom in Kahneman's time. The binding mechanisms upon which the empire was built differ from, and I dare say surpass, 
those of the Latin West, and Byzantine history and culture cannot be understood from the perspective of the same inner sisters. Although the beginnings of a Byzantine state and its particular arrangement depend on one of the most important tra translaciones in history, and that is founding of Constantinople, that particular translatio depended on two inputs different from any other that subsequently <coughs> happened in the Latin West. It showed homogeneity with the original idea of Romanicus, and that's why we refer to original Augustine Romanicus, uh, which was uh, founded on uh, the myths of the, uh, the, the founding of the town of Rome. Um, and uh, not the last revision before, and secondly, it revived and extended the properties of the original idea of humanitas. Uh, we could elaborate on this last statement, but due to the time limit, uh, we should leave it open for the moment, but we can only say that we talk about that um, Congress of uh, Historians in Rijeka about founding of Constantinople and that idea of humanitas and maybe to say inclusivity of that town which should have resembled the uh, original Roman idea. Uh, let us just say that the result of that translatio to Constantinople resulted in the formation of an empire which functioned as a complex system and thus developed all of its properties non linearity, self redefinition, spontaneous self reordering, adaptability, and feedback groups. At the time, as the time of the Great Crisis shows, from the time of Emperor Heraclius I, the Emperor became a master in exploiting these properties and survived exactly because of those properties. In terms of internal organization, as demonstrated by, for example, Arthur Stanley Medoy in the 70s, or Slobodan Chulchi, really one of the greatest Byzantinists in uh, 2000, or more recently by the studies of Douglas Whaley, and many others, the empire was a patron of self-sustainable, self-organizing and adaptable regions which were able to function because of their existence in the empire relied in the same basic principle. From the perspective of Western scholars, cultural hegemony of Constantinople was usually assumed, but in reality, relations between Constantinople and the regions of the empire functioned on the principle of figure groups, meaning that as the regional art acquired and incorporated impulses from Constantinople, Constantinople was in turn affected by the feedback of regional production and in the circle again. So, although the empire had an official center, it was not the center in Western terms, no matter how the West perceived it. The unifying elements were not so much the military, education, theology, language, as it was the underlying concept of a complex system which can hardly be grasped from the Western perspective. We could broaden our understanding of that Eastern Byzantine way of structuring of the empire and its region by using, using Paul Sears, uh, networks, um, who is a uh, you know, philosopher and uh, um, post structuralist philosopher and complexity researcher. His conclusion that connectionist neural networks better illustrate complex systems than anything else. He wrote, processing is distributed over the network and the roles of the various components or groups of components change dynamically. In turn, it means that these networks can be compared to the brain, which consists of neurons and synapses in rich informational interrelations. Neural networks contain multiple densely interconnected processing nodes. Each node is influenced by and influences multiple other nodes. So we're actually referring to the uh, neurosciences and the, the, the research connected with the neuroplasticity of the brain and the, the changes that happen in the brain uh, and try to compare it uh, with functioning of Byzantine Empire. This is probably the best way to illustrate how uh, Byzantine Empire really functioned as a system with multiple, almost infinite number of interconnected nodes so it becomes clear why the concept of center and periphery is not easily applicable in this case. In the case of Adriatic, especially Dalmatia, a number of nodes can be identified and the most prominent one was Zadar. 
As we, as we have already stated, Karaman's insistence on indigenous tradition and indigenous expression was not entirely wrong. We spoke about that on the uh, last year's symposium colloquium in Split, about that uh, Karaman's vision of old Croatian churches of free shapes, which are usually considered completely false, um, a conclusion and completely false uh, paradigm, but we, we uh, try to explain why it is not so. Um, Dalmatia developed its own modes of expression, but its notes, if we can call them now that way, were interrelated with other notes and integrated into the same grid. What is more important, art and architecture of the early medieval Croatian principality cannot be excluded from that grid. Local Dalmatian builders were the only who had the expertise and architectural know-how to provide their services to the Slavic arrivals. The typology, morphology, and building techniques uh, of early medieval architecture in the territory of Croatian principality really confirms it. And uh, of course, as we already talked about that, uh, I will not re uh, repeat uh, many things, but just Pancha uh, Vejic's um, research on the hexagon church type and its origin in Zadar Baptist Stadium. So, one consistent early medieval type which is really specific for a certain micro region. Uh, further on, regionally specific elaboration of the same basic ideas can be traced in Romanian, as we call it, a, a architecture across the Mediterranean. And here are just a few examples, even for comparisons with Dalmatian architecture. These are really just a few examples on general level, just uh, chosen on general level. Um, we tried to, uh, to put more Greek examples, examples from uh, Cyprus, from Greece, because southern Italian examples are, are very well known as comparative material to, to the church types of Dalmatian architecture. The insistence on Western Frankish liaisons when interpreting early medieval Dalmatian architecture seems in some instances almost absurd. Theodor's oratory in Germany, the Pre, often referred to, is actually an unicum in early medieval Frankish architecture, and Theodor's connections with and inclinations to the Eastern cultural domain, and by that we mean both Byzantine and Hebrew, is well documented in written sources because he was actually a translator of Greek and Hebrew. Uh, so, um, the conception that we usually come upon that uh, uh, Eastern uh, models were, uh, were uh, mediated through Western models is completely absurd. It would be hard to imagine that Carolingian architecture, at the time still occupied by learning to read Redegar's chronicles and developing its narratives about, about Frankish ethnicum, had a decisive influence on the culture ages old, solid, Unwavering and highly sophisticated. That extends on the slide drag setting in Dalmatian Kintron and Croatian Principality, which was judging by the case of Goldshop, and you all know about the case of Goldshop on the, uh, the, and his relationship with Dux um, That Principality was quite independent from the start, and uh, its first neighbors were Dalmatian Romaira. Uh, and this last term we use as a more appropriate in description of members of the so-called Byzantine society, referring uh, to some research of Tradbo, for example, who says that Byzantines would probably never understand that concept, what that means, because they call themselves Romans and consider themselves Romans. Uh, in the end, in the end, we should return to Karaman's paradigm and the concept of borderland culture of late antique and early medieval Dalmatian. Situated on the edges of a great and sophisticated, sophisticated empire, it can hardly be seen as a borderline area receiving equally strong or equally weak signals from two competing cultural spheres or cultural centers, and we have put here the Frankish Imperial Rome and the Papal Rome. The linear paradigm, to reach again for a metaphor, that crushes like waves, when we talk about waves, 
on hard, hard cliffs of, of complex system of Romanian culture. The answer could be epitomized in the so-called Roman complex for the whole early medieval West. So, to conclude, when discussing late antique and early medieval art and architecture uh, on the Eastern Adriatic, especially Dalmatia, Kahneman's paradigm for classifying and interpreting works of art should be taken with great caution and should not be accepted without further reconsideration in the context of contemporary uh, Byzantine studies and complex system theories. Thank you. Very interesting connection between uh, neuro neuroscience, neural networks, and the distributions of prototypes types in the regions around Eastern Mediterranean. And now uh, I would like to call our next speaker, Milan Feltz, who came from Institute of Arts and History, Zagreb. And uh, he will talk about illuminations in Gaelic manuscripts and the art of Belgrade. Thank you. So, uh, everybody is probably a pirate now, but I, I still hope you won't fall asleep during my lecture. Uh, in, the, in the early 1960s, in Croatian art history, the rehabilitation of artistic creation of the local milieu reached its culmination. At the time, when, when Yugo Karaman's study on the activities of the domestic environment took, uh, took its final form, a significant exhibition entitled Miniature in Yugoslavia was being prepared in Zagreb. Karaman's study Karma Studio was published in 1963. The exhibition staged at the Museum of, art, uh, of Arts and Crafts in Zagreb in 1964. For the first time, the exhibition presented illuminated Gregoritic codices as, as part of a larger overview that included Latin, Cyrillic, Greek, Hebrew, and Oriental manuscripts from the former Yugoslavia. In fact, a miniature from the so-called Second Baron Breviary is depicted on the front cover of the exhibition catalog. The part of the exhibition dedicated to Croatian Gabolitic manuscripts was covered by art historian Branko Fucic, who a year earlier published the first extensive monograph on Istrian frescoes. In this book, Fucic gave an art historical interpretation and topographical overview of the corpus of wall paintings created in the local environment of Istria during the Middle and Early New Ages. It is not surprising that Fucic, in parallel with Istrian frescoes, was intensely engaged in illuminations of Gabolitic books, namely, as is known, Istria has been one of the most important focal points of Croatian Glagolithicism for centuries. In the method methodology of research and interpretation of visual material, Branko Fucic was for sure a disciple of Yugo Karaman. He convincingly confirmed Karaman's thesis of the artistic freedom of the local environment on the concrete pictorial heritage of Istria, to which belongs the vernacular book production in Glagolitic scriptures. Therefore, I would like uh, I would like this short review to be an homage not only to the Karaman, but as well to Branko Fucic. The rise and climax in the production of Glagolitic illuminated manuscripts coincides with the rise and climax in the creation of Istrian frescoes. These two closely related phenomena strongly characterize the culture in the nature and late Middle Ages with the beginnings of the Renaissance in the area of Istria and Croatian literal. 
In the frescoes, as well as in the illuminations of glagolitic policies, the trait of the indigenous art of the local environment has been fully recognized and evaluated by Fuchs. However, this line has a wider geographical range. It is also recognized as a basis for the interpretation of the illumination of Slavic liturgical books in the Middle Ages in general, both those written in Glagolitic script in Croatian regions and those written in Cyrillic script on the territory of Bosnia and Serbia. Similar features were also recognized on tombstones called Stechci, parallel products of the culture of the South Slavic region of the time. These are, however, topics that we cannot deal with uh, here because of the shortness of time. Before the Zagreb exhibition in 90, 1964, Croatian art historians only sporadically reflected on the illuminations in the Glagolitic liturgical codices. In 1933, Lubo Karaman himself dedicated an overall study to the artistic equipment of books in Dalmatia. In this study, referring to the manuscripts of the 15th century, he points out that, quote, for us, the codices written in Croatian language and Glagolitic script are particularly interesting. He paid most of his attention to the missal of Hrvoje Vukčić Hrvatinic, uh, the Bosnian duke and then ruler of Split, which was discovered in Istanbul at the end of the 19th century. The missal appears to have been transcribed and painted in a local scriptory. According to the record in the missal itself, the scribe, the scribe had the, the Slavic folk name Butko. Karaman states, that the miniatures of the missal were made by what some unknown master who knew well the style of late Gothic Florentine miniatures. In this stylistic assessment, Karaman repeats the meaning given by Franz Wickhoff, a prominent member of the Vienna School of Art History, who wrote the first art historical article about miniatures published in the monograph on the missal in 1891. More important is here, however, Karaman's comment to one of the calendar miniatures in the Misa, namely in the thumbnail picture next to the month of January. So Karaman wrote, you can see around the table three persons. One is about to cut a large bread in which the sign of the cross is cut in. Such bread, Karaman writes, is a custom in our people from Christmas to the Three Kings. And this picture is a proof that Hrvoj's missal was decorated with miniatures by a local master to whom our folk customs were known. Besides, as we shall prove that the master was working in the domestic milieu, Karaman cites the opinion of Franz Wickhoff, according to which on one miniature, the, char the characteristic bell tower of St. Duet Church in Split was reproduced. Later, it was noticed that the architecture on as many as three miniatures corresponds to the stylized appearance of Split and the Diocletian Palace. The origin of illuminations in the domestic or local environment established on the basis of iconographic motives is one of the arguments that speak in favor of the cultural maturity of this environment. Although the miniatures, as Vikov taught and Karaman accepted, were made under the influence of the style of the Tuscan Proto-Renaissance, the master who painted them comes from the local milieu. In the 1930s, when he wrote his study, Karaman's emphasis on the affiliation of miniatures and their master to the local cultural environment was farther important because different, mostly Italian art historians, like for example Alessandro Dudan, insisted that everything valuable in Dalmatia's artistic heritage was made by the masters who came from Italy or that those works were brought from Italian cultural centers, mostly from Venice. 
On the one hand, as we have seen, the use of folklore motifs is recognized as an authentic iconographic component of local art. On the other hand, its main design trait is defined as primitive and drastic. This definition is primarily intended to point out the ignorance or the neglection of the stylistic categories of elite art in the creation of the local environment. Masters who take artistic commissions do not bother to keep up with the actual stylistic currents from cultural centers or even to imitate the features of the artistic mainstream. As a representative example of the rustic style in the globalitic illumination, Fucic points out the already mentioned so-called second Vera Bredier, written at the beginning of the 15th century. According to Fucic, it was created in an artistically almost autarkic ambience in a countryside where the primitive artistic expression could barely be influenced by stylistic currents. The naughty, clumsy characters of saints, drawn with uncontrolled scribe's pen, are almost at the level of a children's drawing. But from their popular naive speech emanates a unique breath of life, growing with the intensity of pure, screaming colors, red, yellow, green, and purple. The political illumination is often encountered is a sympathetic artistry intended for the lower, poor, and less educated layers of commissioners. For the most part, the analytic and liturgical books were indeed modestly decorated. However, despite the fact that the analytic codices have been created in the artistically autarkic milieu, as Kuchi said, it cannot be remotely claimed for the analytic scribes and illuminators that they were ignorant of what is happening on the contemporary art scene. Even in this autarkic milieu, from different sides, the actual stylistic currents came that influenced the artistic creation of the local environment. The most impressive example of the, en uh, of the entry of contemporary artistic mainstream style into the globalistic liturgical books are the miniatures of the most representative Liturgical Codex from the Gavolitic territory in the 14th century. This is the Missal of Prince Novak from 1368. Prince Novak ruled in the area of Lika and Krbala, that is on the territory of central Croatia. The prince intended the Missal for the church of his burial. The church it was, the, what church it was, we don't know. According to an account in the Missal, however, we know that in uh, 1405, the missile was sold by Novak's son Peter to the parish community in the eastern town of Nubla. After that, in 1512, the missile passed into the ownership of the nearby parish church of Roche in Istria. Today, it is in Vienna. Its miniatures, crucifixion, the man of sorrows, and depictions of evangelists are clearly the work of a master who belongs to the main artistic current of the Venetian Trecento on the trail of Paolo Veneziano. Based on the analysis of the Sanctorale, it is believed that the missile originated in Zada. Analogous to this, it is assumed that an unknown by painter from the circle of followers of Paolo Veneziano who then was active in Zadar, was engaged to make the miniatures. The miniatures are completely distinguished from the artistic character of the initials, made in traditional ornamentation common in glagolitic medieval codices. But thanks to the ample use of gold, their ornamentation also acquired an aristocratic character. In the painting and decoration of the missile, the general rule is confirmed. The more significant the client, the greater the degree of lavishness of miniatures, but also the connection of the domestic environment with the artistic fashion of art centers. 
It is precisely by these features that the missile is followed by the aforementioned missile of the Duke Hervoye, a book that undoubtedly had a high representative value for its climate. This is evident evidenced by two miniatures depicting the Croy on horseback and his coat of arms at the end of the missile. In Croatian medieval artistic heritage, this is a unique case of such explicit aristocratic representation in a liturgical book. The fact that at the beginning of the 15th century, Prince Noah's missile was bought for the amount of uh, 45 ducats for one collective user, namely for the parish of Nugla in Istria, speaks of the considerable economic strength of Gabolitic users and commissioners. Often, in fact, priests who used the old Slavic language in the liturgy and wrote in the vernacular script were perceived as simple, poor, ignorant or conservative members of the local communities. However, they were by no means such in the developed Middle Ages. Their economic background was solid, corresponding to their reputation in the local noble courts. They often served as notaries, prefects, and judges. In a number of cities, as St. Motus, Vinotol, Vrbnik, Drovnik, Brivil, etc., they had their church capitals with schools and teachers. Already in 1483, they had a Gabolitic missal printed, which is in fact the first Croatian printed book. The first confirmed Gabolitic printing, how operated in Sen in 1494. All this speaks of the, the central economic power of Gabolitic clergy, which began to decline during the 16th century with the loss of the territory displacement and poverty of the people caused by the Ottoman conquests. Catholic renewal in the 17th century was not too sympathetic to the peculiarities of the Glagolitic clergy and their liturgy as well. Episcopal visitations often criticized them for being too secular. Miniatures painted in the stylistic mainstream, such as those in Prince Novak Missal, had resonance in local production. A testimony to this are miniatures in the missiles attributed to the scribe and probably the miniaturist Bartol of Krbava from the beginning of the 15th century. The crucifixion in the Ljubljana, in the Ljubljana missal, in Vienna missiles undoubtedly show that Bartol knew the illuminations in the missile of Prince Noah. All the figures in the paintings of, the, of his crucifixions are almost transcribed from the crucifixion in Prince Noah's missile. Of course, these miniatures differ significantly in the quality of the artistic execution, and especially in colorism. These differences are typical of artists whose achievements do not show that, that refinement of the form that works of elite art possess. On the other hand, Glagolitic artists, as Bartol of Krbala, are excellent decorators. The proof to these are large, richly decorated initials in the missiles. It is the initials that reveal the tendency to excessive decoration that Nubo Karaman mentions as one of the features of provincial art. His famous book on the activities of the domestic environment, Nubo Karaman, ends with the sentence, I quote, along uh, uh, although I did not go in this book to rehabilitate the values of our artistic heritage, I think it follows from everything I said in it that we should not detest expressions such as provincial, peripheral, conservative, retarded, primitive, or in metier unrefined art, because these, as we have seen, are not always negative phenomena. Karaman's younger contemporary, Janko Fujic, went a step farther with the interpretation of Eastern frescoes and glagolitic illuminations. He interpreted the apparent formal shortcomings, loud and clear, as the virtues of an indigenous artistic creation of the local environment. This creation 
is powered by various sources by following the expectations of the local commissioners. I believe that on this trail, outlined by Karaman and amplified by Fujic, it is necessary to continue to explore and discover new features which belong to the freedom of artistic creativity in the local media. Thank you. Another video. So uh, let's start. With the <coughs> It is an honor to participate in this conference, and we will go ahead and thank you to this person. Actually, he did get to know me about a lot of research. When I'm focusing on part of the local subject, I would like to start off with a brief introduction regarding the location uh, of the Asian settlement, as well as the Church of St. John the Baptist, where the basic sub research is already. The Yashka Development was built in the 1780s on the outskirts of the Hungarian territory in Toronto Castle, uh, present-day Barak in Borbine, north of Serbia. Later on, in 1781, the 30,000 acre land was able to be found in Bashka, which was the Luka Shaka, a lady of this region. Now the family was very affluent and wealthy, and in just a few decades, when the actual estate became a famous small farm and remained the property of the one family for 160 years. Over time, the opposing estate became one of the major cultural centers of the farm, and lots of the family actually became noble. In addition to many famous performers, uh, the nine-year-old Franz Liszt performed with the actual Jansel Organ in 1820. For years, the Jansel was born in place of domestic and foreign characters, along with the Archbishop Franz Ferdinand and other impactful political figures of the time. The Roman Catholic Church of St. John the Baptist was built in 1864, which will be carved from Pachka. On the site of the former 1794 church, which was heavily dedicated to the fire. Its father, the distinguished Austrian general Jacob Blasen de Etchka, fought to the side of the Vienna court during the 1848 Hungarian Revolution, and after a successful military career, returned to his estate in front of the county. By erecting a vehicle addicted to his estate, which will pay tribute to the land of lineage and created a new religious figure for the inhabitants of Africa. During the ceremonial consecration of the new church, General Walter provided him the order of St. George, given to him by the third pile of the night. Uh, St. James St. Pontic is a military career in Vienna, but the social European influence is evident in architectural and artistic installation of the city. And architect named Karski was attracted to the draft, who made two designs of the uh, near Romanesque style, while the construction work itself was carried by uh, the engineers that were. Architectural historicism was one of the most specific and ideological tendency of the time, mostly represented in the Japanese cities of Central Europe, such as Vienna and Lebanon. By erecting uh, the building in the Neo Romanized manner, the regime showed that he was up to date with the current established forms of the time, which is also communicated by the hiring of the Central European artists, the Great Fresco and the Church of Between 1862 and 1854, artists Joseph Goyner and Adolf Van der Rand were still in Ashley Gasol, painting the interior of the 
Can you please? Yes. We are just waiting for my presentation to start. Okay, I just have to start this real quick. Okay, nice. This presentation will focus on several time and style units through which the architecture of niche had undergone during the 19th and 20th centuries in order to emphasize the relationship between the main centers and the periphery. During the 19th century, niche was the periphery of the Ottoman Empire, which consequently conditioned its visual identity to be based on the interaction between Serbia folk architecture and Ottoman architecture with distant reminiscence of the architecture of the center, which was Istanbul at that time. The last decades before the liberation, during the 16th and 70s, conditioned the influence of the classicist order and proportion in the design of buildings. The explanation for this mixture lies in the gradual influences of Western European architecture, as well as the fact that after the liberation of Belgrade, a large number of Ottomans moved to southern Serbia, mostly to Nish which was the second largest city in Serbia as we know it today. After 1867, the Ottoman government significantly weakened, and in 1878, the liberation of Nish was finalized. Here you can see Bechet Bay's residence. It was not built all at once. Instead, it was shaped gradually by adding components for an extended period of time, from the end of the 18th century to 1860s. Despite the time difference, the resident parts are relatively uniform in style. Characteristic Ottoman porches, bay windows, four pitched roofs, and chimneys with caps are present in this complex. This is one of the first uh, few preserved photographs with which it is possible to glimpse the entire residence. The architecture of residence and public buildings directly influenced the uh, climate of folk houses. Evidence for that claim lies in the house of Nish merchant Stavon Kozic Kilokovsky, which was built during the last phase of construction of previously shown Bechet Bay's residence. Indeed, from 1875, only a few years uh, before the liberation, testifies that a certain individual, Ahmed Mehmetovic, started building the house as well. Considering the coming war, it was not finished, so in 1878, it was purchased by a famous Nish merchant. The other Stankovic Stambolia. This example, uh, example clearly shows the influences of classicist symmetries. Houses like this and the previous one were architecturally more complex and luxurious, while the people from the lower class lived in smaller, undecorated, and of course, less, less expensive buildings. One of the components they all had in common was a four pitch roof with chimney caps. As a result of the Ottomans moving to the south, Belgrade was reaffirmed as a center, which reflected in the architecture of Nish with a mixture of styles between 1878 and 1914. Unlike other centers throughout Europe, the cities of the liberated kingdom of Serbia did not have gradual or even linear developments of styles, but they accumulated and intertwined due to centuries of suppression. Such cultural, historical, and political circumstances have led to the almost simultaneous design of buildings in a classicist, rom romantic, academic, and secessionist manner. The most famous names of Belgrade's architectural practice have created their significant works in Niche in this period, which made Niche architecture a kind of mirror to Belgrade's. Architects such as Danilo Vladislavovic, Milo Radovic, and Dmitry Tileko have marked their mark, uh, have left their mark sorry, on niche architecture. Apart from Belgrade architects, there were also certain engineers working in niche, such as Ivan Poznic, whose professional work has yet, not yet been researched and published in historiography. Um, as you can see, this is Hockwood's project of the officer home from 1819. Um, it is a clear testimony of the liberation's aftermath uh, presented as a change of style. A symmetrical ground floor building with a protruding central part and re reducted surface decoration announced later architectural complexity. Uh, niche engineering headquarters had marked the turn of the century as well. Uh, this building was designed by the Belgrade architect Danilo Vladislavovic in the spirit of Romanticist architecture, which confirms the, test, uh, the thesis that the architecture of Niche followed the development path of Belgrade architecture at this time. As a military facility, this building resembled a castle with polygonal towers, which is one of the features 
of mentioned romanticism. A distant secessionist overtone is present in the building of the district administration, which is today known as the Palace of Justice. Situated on the Sintelich uh, Square, this building makes the compact visual identity of one of the most remarkable crossroads of Nish. It is now that the works were performed by Milan Stefanovic in 1910. All of the above projects uh, should be viewed through the prism of the relationship between the center and the periphery with the denom denominator for the center containing the education of architects in Vienna, Prague and other developed arid areas. Several factors have marked the architecture of the interwar niche. It is primarily important to glimpse the jump in birth rates that appeared as a logical response to the aftermath of war losses. There was also a sudden influx of people from rural areas who came to Nish in search of work and higher living standards, which consequently led to the greater need for architectural production. Numerous institutions were established during this period, such as schools, hospitals, and banks. Besides that, the industry was rapidly developing. The interwar period is also marked by the immigration of people from Russia, among whom were many architects who were educated either in their home country, like Julian Dupont. Uh, some of the architects received, received their higher education at the technical faculty in Belgrade, such as Alexander Medvedev, and there is evidence that the architect of uh, Salvo Tatarino was educated at a technical school in Zagreb. With a di di direct influence of education in these places, together with well-known Belgrade architects and domestic engineers, these people shaped the architecture of Niche primarily in the academic and modernist style. During this period, Niche had an active technical department and a couple of certified engineers and architects with their own offices, such as Dragon Milicevic and above mentioned Alexander Medvedev. The role of Minister Dragic Cvetkovic is also very important, and he understood the function that architecture can hold in the broader political context of the formation of Niche as a peripheral center. Apart from being the personal client of some architects, he was also the initiator of numerous projects. For example, he initiated the upgrade of New Cathedral Bell Tower, Labor Exchange Institution Building, and uh, Apprentices Hall. Thanks to his engagement, the Niche elite enthusiastically approached the, uh, the engagement of a large number of architects, and Niche as a peripheral center started influencing the architecture of the surrounding cities, starting with Alessins. Here we'll see some examples of significant and influential interwar buildings. Uh, this used to be State Mortgage Bank, but today's Central Post Office. It was built by Belgrade architect uh, Boyan Mitrovic around 1930. Here you can see the couple of strong academic columns and other sculptures that signify our industrial world. On the left, you can see uh, Banovina Theatre. Uh, Selva Tutarino designed Banovina Theatre's building in 1939 as a combination of modernism and academism, which notes the wall on the front of the city. Uh, you can see how refined forms in the upper sentiment are concluded with the massive pillars in the lower one. Uh, in the same year, Medvedev designed his most prominent modernist building, the Apprentice Home. Uh, home. The exterior is an example of flat and rounded surfaces with a standing clock at the top. I'm now showing you this drawing since it's really hard to take a photo of the whole building complex. After the Second World War, there was a major change in the political system. Uh, socialism resulted in stronger communication between the centuries of the former Yugoslavia, and thanks to that, uh, and to the additional input of our external influences, the architecture of Niche had become more complex on the one hand and more uniform on the other. There were two strong uh, currents. The first one was the planned construction of niche settlements such as Dortmund, Marger, or previously Lenin Boulevard, now Boulevard Nemanica. Uh, the second current is focused on innovative uh, projects such as uh, expressive sculptural building health center in niche from 1962 by architectural duo Mirjan Jovanovic and Svetislav Markovic and post Dortmund built in the 70s by architect Kostin Marjanovic. 
uh, this building is called the Tel Architectural in historiography because of the appearance of the exterior, which uh, in some way gives the impression of connection with the building's main purpose. Uh, the new so uh, socialist stratum of society actively participated in their architectural activity and development of niche as a new center. There are indeed many different examples that would ex excellently illustrate the development of niche after the Second World War, but in accordance with the topic, I will stop here and move to the key part of this presentation. Several indicators were emerging as a sign of a new center of authentic architectural thought and practice in Serbia. The primary role played the founding of the Faculty of Civil Engineering in 1960 and the founding of the Society of Architects just a year later. After that, the Institute for Civil Engineering and Architecture was founded in 1973. Scientific papers of the Institute published in professional journals have indirectly contributed to the development of the Department of Architecture, which during the following years, concluding with the contemporary period, established the existence of the new School of Architecture. During the 70s and 80s, the Society of Architects of Niche founded numerous architectural exhibitions and events. Although most of the architects from this society and from this time in general received their formal education in Belgrade, their architectural activity brought novelties and changes. And they were major changes at the time. The bearers of the new architectural thought were also members of the bureaus uh, such as Niche Project and Invest Project. In the first place, and later in 1992, the civil engineer Dragovic Stojanovic founded the company Kappa Project. Of course, there are many other bureaus nowadays, such as Archidec uh, or MG Project and similar. In 1993, the Institute of Civil Engineering and Architecture founded the annual journal Science and Practice, and their published papers were focused on engineering and architectural practice. Uh, I will now present some individuals who, with their work, laid the foundation for, for future generations of architects. The multi-generational uh, contribution of the Budjevac family to the formation of the new school of architecture is very important. Alexander Budjevac and his colleague Ljubka Kovacevic uh, excelled in designing a then unique project in Niche, the sports and recreation center child in the late 1970s. Following the current trend in the architecture, the building was harmonized with the, exist the existing identity of the park and its surroundings. The structurally strong building made of reinforced concrete carried the dose of abstraction of form, uh, which was further enhanced by the use of glass and copper. Another architect who went a step further in researching materials was Frederick Tojanic with a solution for the new shopping center culture. Uh, although the, it, it was built between 19 and nine, um, 1990 and 1993, Janic uh, won the competition in 1981, which is a bit early for this glass structure. Uh, but it was built later due to the lack of finances and problems with securing land, but about that some other time. <coughs> His dances are based on striving uh, for a sense of uh, weightlessness and the materialization of the facade, as well as the idea that the building functions as a mini city with streets uh, and it even has uh, marks in it where the streets are supposed to, supposed to be. I would like to show you just one more building before I conclude. Uh, although a couple of years deviate from the time frame of this presentation, uh, the, chap the chapel designed by Sasha Budjevac for the Bubin Memorial Center, um, Memorial Park, sorry, uh, illustrates not only the original architectural thought, but also active research of uh, sacral architecture. In conclusion, the architecture of Niche was originally based on the Ottoman visual identity, after which, as a dependent periphery, it adopted the so-called European features. In the interwar period, it gradually uh, took shape at an internal local level. In the post-war period, concluding with the 90s, the architecture of Niche became independent, thus affirming itself as an important center. Future research of architecture of the early 21st century will support the thesis of the existence of a new school of architecture established at the turn of the millennia. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I call the other two.
speakers to take their seats. Uh, so, I have no doubt that after this session, you will have a lot of questions. Because uh, there is a lot of interesting topics, subjects, ideas, and some, something like that. We can start with the first one. Criticism, of course, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, the first was uh, Nikolina Vajakovic. So, is there any remarks, questions from audience about her paper, ideas, approach, or something like that? Don't disappoint in me because I respect that you have a lot of interesting questions, opinions at least. Uh, there is one. The depressing one. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, uh, I was at the Split Conference last year, and I, although, uh, and I heard uh, your, your paper was read there, and I find it quite um, uh, refreshing to hear some new theories about the churches we all knew, know about our, uh, from our uh, cultural heritage. So uh, I think it's intriguing for me. Thank you for your uh, uh, con contribution. And it also uh, changes some of the theories, but also develops further art history. And I think that's the point of, the, of, of art history and theories to develop the, the, the overall knowledge about uh, what we have. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, she is talking for me. <laughs> so, uh, I'm interested if I understand very well. This uh, crossing of the borders between the sciences and approaches and something like that. Uh, between uh, neuroscience and neural networks in the brain and the parallel with the uh, Relationship between uh, center and periphery, periphery in Eastern Mediterranean world during late antique or early medieval period. So, if Brunisha, the Romanian's position is on the periphery of the back wall, uh, where is the center? Like the brain. There's, where is the center in the brain? New, uh, new, uh, I'd like to know. Where is the center? Is there two centers? Many centers? It's, yeah. uh, I, I think there's a very uh, great um, attempt to connect two, two very, very different uh, sides and positions uh, because we don't know almost anything about the narrow networks in the brain. And just a little bit more about connections during the late deal or um, period. Yeah, the, uh, that is not actually our original idea so much as uh, from reading this post-structuralist philosopher, we actually uh, realized that he uh, he is the one who, who who told that complex systems would be best explained. Uh, like uh, the function of the brain. So it's actually his idea. And uh, the Byzantine uh, um, em empire uh, as such in contemporary Byzantine studies uh, is studies uh, studied as a complex system. So it was just our parallel to uh, draw that from uh, this uh, uh, philosophy of complex systems and connect it with the, the contemporary um, studies of uh, Byzantine culture. 
And um, about uh, your second uh, question, uh, where is the center? Uh, it's typically a Western question. Uh, yes, we, we, we uh, as uh, uh, Westerners are, uh, and as uh, medievalists who read um, Western authors, are um, actually um, developing that way of linear thinking, and we always try to find the center. Where is the center? which emanates uh, everything into periphery. Of course, that Constantinople is the center. Uh, it's without doubt. But um, uh, this uh, organization of the periphery, as, uh, as some uh, Greek scholars, uh, for example, uh, claim today, is uh, uh, not so as the periphery, but they call it a regional. Exactly because of these uh, feedback loops, uh, exactly but, uh, 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 because of that um, self-maintenance of this uh, regional phenomena. And uh, if you just try to, um, for example, um, think about... Uh, I was not elaborating on, on those uh, uh, church typology because we already done that in split, but uh, Karaman called them churches of three shapes. And during my whole studies, I, uh, I was uh, hearing the implications that it's not true, that, it's, uh, that these are not free shapes, that they are very well-defined shapes, that they have their prototypes, that their prototypes are actually from the West. Uh, but things are not so simple, so I think that the truth is somewhere between free shapes, because they're not completely free shapes, uh, and that strict typological classifications given by Marasovic, for example, which are quite useful and needed in our uh, studies, uh, but um, too rigid uh, to, to, to grasp what was happening here. And if we talk about the center, uh, for example, I, I won't be uh, any longer, Zada is one, no, one center. It's probably the, the most important center after the fall of the after the fall of Ezekiel. Um, and the dispute whether the Church of Holy Trinity um, is a copy of copy of Aachen Chapel or something else with uh, new uh, proposals from Neven Buddha that uh, it might, may, may have been funded by, uh, by, by uh, Eastern Emperor. By Eastern. So it's, a, it's an unicum. Uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, comparable, it is comparable, but uh, that scheme of finding and uh, insisting on finding prototypes is, I think, uh, what is wrong. Uh, when, uh, for example, you, uh, you take uh, all those uh, churches of free shapes, uh, I, I, I call them, we call them Romaian architecture. Why? Because we don't want to call them Byzantine, because as I said, Byzantines would not understand that concept. They consider them since Romans. So maybe it's for us also, because uh, when we say Byzantine, we always think of something strange, something not ours, something from other culture. Actually, it's our culture. It's in the, 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 um, the, the bottom, at the bottom, because it's Roman culture. And um, uh, these uh, hexagon churches that I tried to Extract just as one type uh, are very, very well model actually that regionality. They are unicorn. They will be seen before in um, funeral anti late antique architecture or later even on the north. But at that time, at that place, they actually present the unicorn and they are maybe the best representative or one of the representatives of that regionality. Southern the Dalmatian churches uh, with cupola are one of them. They differ from Italian, Greek, Greek but yes, but they are actually uh, variations of similar ideas across the Mediterranean. So we just try to emphasize that regionality of Mediterranean and, and to, to actually put our heritage again closer to that grid, uh, and not so much as we think very often politically motivated, ideologically motivated, pushing to the West. Uh, that's, that's it. Thanks. So, uh, 
uh, if there are any other questions about this topic, are you clear with this? Yeah. Satisfied with this explanation? <laughs> so, uh, we can uh, go further. So, uh, there is some connection between uh, in the next uh, paper uh, this autonomous. Uh, we have to, to look this um, phenomenon in periphery like some vertices in other light. I think there is a, a key key uh, word uh, about Fuchs approach and Karman approach. Yeah. So I think there is a very a very good uh, point out from your know, paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I want to give some, as I said, a homage to Branko Fuchs, who is really an outstanding art historian in Croatia in the last century. <laughs> He was some, uh, we can say he was a, not directly uh, in, uh, pupil, but uh, for sure influenced by Ivo Karman. Everybody was influenced by Ivo Karman. Uh, I can also say for myself that I was also influenced. But this is not my theory. This is uh, what I said. It is only an illustration of the theory. And it's, uh, of course, uh, as uh, every theory, in, uh, it has its good and its weak sides, its strong and its weak sides, and we can discuss it uh, in, in every aspect of, uh, of art history. I tried to make it uh, a little bit uh, known to you, uh, this, uh, especially in this field of the uh, uh, glagolitic manuscripts, which uh, and the illuminations in glagolitic manuscripts, which are really uh, Unique uh, artistic uh, pro unique artistic products in the whole of, of Europe, so we can say so. And there are also, of course, many connections to other Slavonic, as I said, uh, uh, codices from this uh, Middle, Age, uh, Middle Age and uh, early, uh, early modern period, time and so on. Okay. <laughs> so. Is there any other question from the audience? Yes? Yes, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, you mentioned uh, about the style, that it was almost um, purposely childlike. I was wondering uh, if there was, that, that is regarding the style, but are there any differences um, on the central and peripheral iconography? Regarding the the sacral scenes, for example. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, uh, I had it in my paper, but I left I left it out because of shortness of time. Uh, an, an example from the Missal of Duke uh, which is a good uh, good case uh, in this iconograph sanctuary iconography. Um, uh, in one miniature, the, the two cents, one local sense and. Guyam, the patron of Sprig, and the other one, St. Michael, the general saint of the church, appear in the same miniature. Why? Because uh, the feast of the St. Michael are, uh, was uh, uh, imm imminently after the feast of the St. Guyam in Sprig. And so the miniatures connect these two uh, iconographic specificities to one unit, which is, which is really specific for, uh, for this local media. You cannot find it in, in any other uh, manuscript of this time or in, in the general uh, manuscript production. It's really specific for spirit and for, for these miniaturists. So in, uh, there are many examples, of course, it's Santoral, it's saints uh, who are venerated in uh, local milieus. They were also, uh, uh, they were put in the miniatures and so on. Thank you. Yes. Uh, now we have uh, another one. If not, we can uh, hear about the last uh, of papers about modern 
most modern architecture in niche, architecture of 19th and 12th, 20th century. So, uh, are you interested to, to comment or to give some opinion about that or something like that? If we were so tired, no, yes. No, 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 I will say something. No, it, it's good that you're here. You have your PhD on this subject or no? No. Yeah, no, no, I'm on my master's. Right? Oh, great. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. But this is the first research of this okay, subject great. in this context. Yes. Thank you for coming to Zagreb. It would be great to um, communicate also with people, researchers in Croatia, who are dealing with similar um subjects so maybe to connect with people and maybe i'm sure that some architects were working both in serbia and croatia so it would be great to to continue doing research in that that, that area thank you. i agree so, <laughs> so thank you for your comment thank you okay what is scary one of the process of westernization of the of the office of the city I think it's really interesting to see that um, that transformation of the city from the from the more uh, Ottoman-like one into the more European one uh, with the time. So I think that's an interesting process, which which was happening not only in Serbia but also in Bosnia and and uh, Turkey as well. So. Uh, so, um, I think uh, that will be all, but there is no coffee break, this is a good information, because uh, we start immediately on conference closing session. That means that uh, we expect that we have some um, opinions about whole conference. Uh, you, um, I think, uh, now the something like praise, uh, criticism uh, about the subjects, about organization, 